on camera with me this morning. So named, of course, because he filmed the first and, as far as I know, the only live zebra birth in history. And yes, not only are we coming to you live, we are also interactive, so you can send through your questions and your comments, and you can do that on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. James is also out and about with Jean Drown camera, and we have the lovely Kirsty and Jerry in final control. And also send through your questions if you're watching on YouTube. You can put your questions through on the comments section. And we'll see if we can answer some of them for you. You might be wondering, for example, if you are here for the first time and driving around with us in the dark as we wait for, if not a sunrise, then at least a lightning of the grey skies. You might be wondering where we are. We are in Juma and Arethusa game reserves in the Sabi Sands, which is in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. So we drive around in our own little portion of about 4 million hectares of unfenced wilderness area. How exciting is that? Very close to an area known as the highest lion density on the planet. Not just that, but a place fabled for its famous leopard sightings on a chilly morning like this morning driving about in pretty much semi I would say would we call this semi darkness or would we call this darkness I think we'll go with darkness on a 21 degree which is 70 degrees Fahrenheit you never know which mysterious well I was going to say mysterious nocturnal animals that was a mysterious branch that caught my back wheel but mysterious nocturnal animals might show themselves Something like an aardvark, for example, dare I hope, or a porcupine, or a bush baby, or a chameleon, or all manner after the lovely rains that we have received. A small break from our intense, or probably the most intense drought in the last hundred or so years in this area. You might even see some unusual frogs. They've been chirping away, the insects are back out seen some of the largest dung beetles that I've seen in quite a long time, at least for this season, fluttering about. Now, there's always plenty to look at. Like, for example, and now this is a tricky one, there's a bush baby. Let's just see, I think he's going to jump towards us. Come here, little Nahapi. There's the little Nahapi. very far away. He's now in the center of my spotlight. Watch for the movement. There he is. Just jumped somewhere down there. Tricky little beasts to film. No harpies. Oh, the flying ants are here. They're reproductive termites. I'm just going to try and see if I can find him again. He went somewhere in there. Where'd you go, Dave? You vanished. Somewhere in the middle there. Now they, of course, will be having a joyous time catching the odd insect, our smallest primate species. You heard me referring to it as a nach api. In Afrikaans, that translates as a night monkey. Let's go sneak a bit closer. Maybe, maybe he'll let us come a little bit closer and have a better view. They're always a tricky thing. Oh, goodness, I have some spider webs attached to us. Gently trailing through my hair. It's the newest thing in safari fashion. A headdress made of spider webs. Nahapi, little night monkey, is what that translates to. It's a perfect description with their large eyes and bushy tails. Definitely one, I think definitely my favorite primate. Where are you, little Nahapi? Hiding. I think he's escaped us. Dancing away through the trees. Their powerful back legs propelling them from branch to branch in a way that we could only dream of. I've seen them jump along the road before as well. And the distance that they can travel would be the equivalent, probably, if they were our size, of us jumping about, I would say, 
probably about 60 feet, 20 meters per jump. And that's, that's when they're feeling a bit lazy and like not really jumping terribly far as they go along. Now my plans for the morning, apart from finding all manner of lovely nocturnal beasties to show you, will be to head across to the hyena den. It's been a while since I've stopped there and actually seen the hyena cubs out and about. We, we did a brief stop there yesterday morning and Corky was around with one of her twins, so one of the females at the den site, and June as well, along with a journey of giraffe that was taking advantage of all of the bones scattered around the dens and munching on them, as giraffe are prone to do. So while we continue along our search of the northernmost boundary and wait for it to get light enough to pay a visit to the hyena den, why don't you jump onto the back of James Henry's vehicle and find out what his plans are. Good morning. We are here under a gloomy grey dawn sky on our way to Treehouse Dam. And uh, I think Jamie's probably given you all of the details, uh, save to say we would like you to talk to us as much as we would like you to talk to her. So hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv or you can chat to us on the YouTube chat function. On camera today, Jean Dre is wearing this very interesting sort of black buff type of beanie thing over which he has placed a sort of mm, decrepit cowboy hat and a pair of earphones. I mean, he's got quite a get-up going there. My name is James Henry. I must apologize for my headgear, which will be replaced within the next few weeks as I go on leave. It is a seriously disgusting piece of headgear, but less disgusting and offensive than uh, the scars on the back of my head which were not put there by anything very exciting. OK, wonderful to have you along for the drive. And what we're going to do is head along to the dam down here and see if anything's there, simply because it's a good port of call to start with. And then we'll see what tracks come across the roads from activities in the night. We're told that the road is a bush newspaper, where the morning edition, fresh, after the evening is supposed to be full of information, which is true, of course, if it has not been raining. It has been raining a bit. There's a hard crust on the road, which means that unless an, al an animal has got sharp hooves or weighs a couple of tons, it's difficult to see where they've crossed the road. Now, of course, it wouldn't normally be this dark at this time of the day, but for the fact that there's a kilometer of cloud above our heads. We are not complaining about that cloud. We are most grateful for it. Some rain is predicted. And it was just so special yesterday. I think Jamie was chatting to you about the sounds of the frogs and the insects. It was so special last night to see a couple of frogs. We only managed to identify one, a beautiful African bullfrog. But hopefully we'll find a few more in the puddles as the week goes on. And especially as we get a bit of heat which will then bring out all the things that the frogs like to eat. Now, Kevin, you want to have a look at the greenery that has grown as a result of the rain. Kevin, of course we can do that during the course of the day. Uh, hopefully it will lighten up a bit so that we can show you. But you won't notice a massive difference over the last few days simply because Remember, we had that 20 millimeters of rain. That caused a flush. That flush would have extended slightly, but not enormously. And I just want to show you one plant that has changed. Do you see this one here, Jean-André? The one bathed there, yes. The Bobbian Stat or Baboon's Tail, Zero Fighter Retinervus. Now, Zero Fighter Retinervus, which you don't have to remember, but baboon's tail, perhaps you do, is green. And it goes green within a day of becoming wet, but it goes brown again within sort of a few days. So as soon as the surface water disappears, it, those leaves will go brown. And then a few days after it raining, they go green again. So for a long time during much of the summer, huge um, pieces of land are covered in that baboon's tail. Brown, looks like they're dead little bit of rain and they turn this kind of yellow color first and then green almost immediately. It's absolutely amazing. 
So, of course, why they turn green, Kevin, is because I'm assuming, well, they need to be green because that's how they make their energy. That's how they make their carbohydrates for survival. And they make that from carbon dioxide, of course, and water. But they need the chlorophyll, the green, in order to do that. But there's no point in having the green if you don't have enough water to make your carbohydrates. And so that's why when the, there is water, they make the green so that they can make the carbohydrates. So I think you'll find that the green is more a function. Sorry, let me just look around here and think about exactly what I was going to say. Just looking to see if we can find anything lurking. I did see some eyes off to the sort of right-hand side, left-hand side of your screen where I'm shining there. There are some eyes in the bush. Perhaps something exciting. I don't think, I think your angle's got to be there. You've got it there. Impala. Well done. That is exciting, isn't it, John? We've never seen them before. Riveting. Well done. Riveting, yes. Riveting Impala in the dawn light. Now, let's have a listen while we're sitting here. A slightly more exuberant dawn chorus. Lots of Franklins. Robins. Red-backed shrikes. Grey-headed sparrows. If you've ever, if you, I'm sure many of you at home will have domestic sparrows around the place. It's exactly what a grey-headed sparrow sounds like. What else have we got? The old starling in the distance. The dove. It's definitely a little bit louder than it would be. But I know that there are a lot of questions coming through, and there were some from yesterday, about what would happen now that this rain's come. Will the birds sort of hang around a bit longer before they go overseas for their annual migrations? And, you know, will the kind of summer be extended? And the answer is probably not. And it's very interesting because I think birds and plants largely respond to day length as to when they go dormant and when they go migrating. Plants obviously don't migrate because they can't move. Do you understand that, John? Yes. And so as the days get shorter, eventually the birds will decide to leave. So despite the fact that there's a huge amount of insect life for them to now devour, they won't stink, stick around longer. Maybe just a few days or so. But once the day length gets over a certain length, there's going to be a physiological trigger that will make them fly. So as I was saying a few days ago, it's going to be definitely lean times for those migrating species. And I think what we will find is that a smaller proportion of them are going to make it back to their wintering grounds in the north. Um, and then a question about whether the insects are bothersome. And I think that this comes from bark. Is that correct, Justin? Barb. Barb, you want to know if the insects are bothersome. No, they're not, you know. It's actually quite pleasant having them around. Very few of the insects here can do harm. Uh, a few of them are a bit smelly. They've got a bit of a stink to them. And so those are the ones you want to avoid slightly. There's an elephant, jean -Bree. A very small one. It's just over there. Of course, when you see elephants on the left, the first thing you must do is look to the right. There it is. There are a whole lot around here. Sorry, I am parked in the best place, but there's one coming out onto the road. I'm just going to turn the lights off. They don't like the lights. Sorry. There's one coming onto the road in front of us. 
we'll just sit quietly. You can see her ears are open, which means she's just saying, what do you guys want? Why are you here making a noise, shining a bright light in the morning? Look at the termites flying around there. Isn't that wonderful? There's another one there. So, Bob, these insects are not bothersome. I think it's really rather exciting because I know they're going to bring a whole lot of other life. just smelling us, waiting to see what our next move is going to be, and just indicating with those open ears that she'd rather we didn't come closer at this stage. She may well relax, but she's just assessing the situation. I don't know how many there are on this herd, quite a few, it sounds like, probably about 10 or so. There's a little one going across the road. Probably about, mm, what did we say, about 14 months? No, probably less, much less actually. Probably about eight months. If that, sorry, I'm, it's obviously quite dark still. I'd say that little elephant is probably only about four months old. Look at it trying to pick things up with its trunk. That's very clever, not quite all the way up to the mouth. It's very sweet. <laughs> and of course, the elephants will be very defensive of a tiny thing like that. And it's a wonder, you know, we were chatting yesterday about the Sabi Sands elephants and this thing that we get called Sabi Sands Complacency Syndrome. And what it means is that after 30 years of living around vehicles, the elephants here are generally pretty relaxed. Of course, they can come and go from the Kruger, so some of them would, wouldn't be. But it is well to remember that we don't understand what the stresses of elephant life are. And sometimes they can become very stressed, and then they will become threatened, and then they become um, aggressive, if they feel threatened. And the trick is to understand what makes them feel threatened. And if, like that cow did, she indicated that we shouldn't come closer, if we respect that, then, of course, that trust is maintained. That little thing is just hilarious. Now, the trunk is a completely useless appendage at this stage of life. You can see virtually uncoordinated. It doesn't really know what it's doing. This cow is now coming a bit closer with her youngster. Hello, Paul. You're on YouTube and you were watching on that incredible sighting that Dave and I had yesterday where a big cow came out of the bushes and she stopped and almost stood at point in order to just say to us, stop there, don't move. My herd is coming across the road and as long as you don't move, uh, we'll be okay. And the rest of the herd came up and they watched us briefly and it was a very short, sharp, incredible sighting of 50 elephants. Paul, you want to know if this is maybe part of the same herd. Paul, it could be. I mean, I can see and hear about 10 elephants at the moment, but I don't think it's that big. I think if there were 50 of them, we'd hear a bit more. It's not impossible, though, that they're great browsing and grazing further on down the road, though. They seem to be settling down with us now. That said, I don't want to start the vehicle because they are kind of heading this way. So let's just see if they don't come towards us and, and just graze around us, which would be nice. We'll keep watching the behavior all the time. She's still not that comfortable with us. See how she's lifted her head as she walks across the road? It's not sort of in that low position where she's just looking for things to eat. But she's okay. And she's indicating that she's okay because there are two youngsters now just to the left of us. <laughs> A 
and she's comfortable to leave them in our company like that. So I think that's quite telling. She's decided that we're not too terrifying, and so she's left these little ones standing here with us. Sarah, you want to know if they listen with the entire ear or is there a small ear canal? Sarah, exactly like with all... Oh, look, he's picked up a bulb. So he's found a little bulb to eat. I don't think he'll eat the bulb. I bet that he... I think that he will drop the bulb and just eat the leaves. Has he eaten the bulb? I hope so. No, he hasn't. He dropped it, I told you. You hope so, so that I'd be proved wrong. Thank you, jean -Dre. Um, Sarah, you want to know about the ear? All mammals have just got a... a shallow canal or narrow canal and elephants are the same now there we go you can see it there that sort of wrinkly bit in the front here's one coming right by us now that's only about four or five feet away from the vehicle there you can see the ear opening there Sarah that's it there that's the opening there This is wonderful. They're being very relaxed around us. <laughs> He's shaking his bulbs. He doesn't like them, you see. I think they're pretty toxic. They're lilies. And you can see that he's t tasting them. There, he's tasting the whole bulb. Or just the leaves. Let's see if the bulb... The bu I don't think he'll eat the bulb. That uh, flowing of water you can hear is, um, well, <laughs> an elephant caught in a rather inelegant position. Thanks, John, for that uh, beautiful close-up. And you can see it did not arrest the elephant's attention from eating what it is now eating. It seems to be the new growth on a cambritum tree. Natasha, you're in Ontario, and you want to know... John, I'm sorry to huck you here. This guy is throwing these... He's, he was throwing the, the bulbs around. Natasha, you want to know when those little tusks erupt? Natasha, they come out, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in the bulls at about 18 months, and the cows a little bit earlier, actually, about 12 months, just over. Watch him throw here. Try and eat the leaves. Is that not so nice, fellow? Sorry about that. Ooh. Jamie sounds like she's got something absolutely fascinating to show you. Let's go across there. I'll stay with the elephants. The marvellous James has been entertained by the elephants. We never got to the hyena den because as we came round the corner, we found this group of hyenas and this particular sub-adult is being hugely entertaining. He's a little bit bored and whilst very full, is really enjoying the termite explosion. Oh, I found a place where they're coming out. No, not that interesting. Pacing backwards and forwards, trying to entertain himself and chasing flying ants, or the reproductive of the termites, at the same time. Oh, I'm going into the water so that I can urinate. <laughs> Hyenas, whilst wonderful, not the most sanitary of creatures at times. Might go and lie down in this water. I'm really hoping, though, that he continues on trying to catch termites. He's actually Right, let's just see if he does it again. It was so entertaining. He was pirouetting around like dogs do when they chase flies. Oh, there we go, there we go. Found one. Mmm, that one got munched. That one didn't get away like the one before. Now, all of the animals, and I mean, oh, the hyena is up. Being slightly more exciting. All of the animals loving 
the explosion or population explosion of the reproductive termite members. Oh, somebody's got an itch there on the tail. Right, where are you lot off to? Hmm? We follow along and see what's happening in the morning of these hyena. And once they go off the road, then we'll turn around and we'll go back towards the hyena den. The third one has just got up as well, having a quick scratch. So they've spent the evening, by the looks of those full bellies, they've spent the evening foraging. I'm not sure what they managed to find, but whatever it was, it keeps, it's kept them well fed. They're looking distinctly happy, and then they've come across to one of their favorite spots to have a rest. So when the rain comes along this road, we get the hyenas coming to sort of, what could the word be? Wallow, I think is the best description in the puddles and the pans that are all along this road. And it seems to be the favorite spot for the males of the hyena clan and the sub-adults as well. Just make sure I dodge the millipedes at the same time. Lots of them out on the roads. It's all right, boy. You can see, not as round-bellied as we've seen the females before, but still looking very full. And they watch the way that this hyena walks down the road. Watch where its left foot falls in front, and then its back right foot. The way that's the cross fork that I always talk about when we look at their tracks. That energy efficient gait, but also because of the sloping nature of their backs, stops them from stepping on their heels. Cross, 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 cross. By walking like this or going into a trot, they can cover immense distances. You've got far more stamina, probably more equatable to a wild dog than to the movements of a lion in the night. The re that is the reason that they are constructed in the way that they are. Brian, you were wondering, why is a hyena's front leg shorter than its back legs? And the answer is that sloping back serves two functions. One, it serves as a very powerful muscle attachment point for all of the muscles in the jaw. So the jaw muscles are not just connected to the skull and the face, but also strapped down across the chest in a way that enhances the crushing power of those back molars and gives them their ability to crunch through bones. There's another reason, and that's because hyenas have evolved alongside lions and human beings. So they've evolved to be nocturnal so that they don't compete with us, and that they can take advantage of our sleeping time. And when it comes to lions, they have evolved to have a bit more stamina than them and to be able to cover greater distances. They are going to go into this very thick block. Where I'm not going to follow them. We'll only run the risk of damaging the vehicle, which we definitely don't want to do since Rusty has been so good over the last few days. There goes the sub-adult. And then what looks like, to me, one of the clan males, just very full. I'm happy to be corrected on that, though. I'm fairly certain, though, it's one of the males. And off they go. Well, it's light enough for us to head across to the hyena den while we do that. James Hendry has found something else to show you. Two interesting things in that tree over there. One, a bird. The other, an orchid. That orchid is very famous, of course. I have climbed up to try and retrieve bits of, bits of it a few times, and I've always kind of balked at the last, last hurdle. That branch is hollow, and every time I've thought about climbing onto it, the thought of it plumbing, plummeting to the ground with me atop it has made me afraid, and so I've climbed back down the tree. Anyway, up above it, something far more interesting than the travails of my tree-climbing career. That is a white-backed vulture. 
And to many of you in the United States, you'd probably refer to that sort of a bird as a buzzard, which is not the same thing out here, uh, but we'd call that a vulture. And it is a carrion-eating, sort of a scavenging hoover, if you like. They eat away all the dead stuff that is not consumed by the hyenas and the other large carnivores. And one great example of that, of course, is that skinny warthog female who died the other day, unfortunately on International Women's Day. And she, we don't know why she died, but the lion that started to eat her decided she was a bit disgusting and just left her there just to, to rot on the side of the drainage line. And the vultures and the hyenas then completed her over the course of the next day or so. So no matter how rotten or vile something seems to be, something out here will eat it. Now, what I want you to do, I think he's probably going to fly as we drive forward. So, jean if I can ask you to try and keep the camera on him or her. And what I would like you to notice is how difficult it is for this bird to get into the air with flapping flight. It's an extremely expensive and difficult thing for the bird to do. It's designed to soar on thermals. And so for it to fly without any kind of heat coming off the ground is not an easy prospect. It will have to use the height that it's got there to gain sort of some momentum as it flies. Right, here we go. Now watch, it'll probably not fly at all. It'll do precisely as I predicted it would not. It looked like it was going to fly when we came past it. Come on, bird. If I was very nasty, I'd get out of the car and walk towards it, and then it would fly, but I'm not going to do that, simply because it is a bit cold, and I know that it will struggle to fly. It's actually just a nice view of it. Watching us very carefully. They do have a look of death about them. And we have discussed this, but it is a sadness that they are becoming more and more rare. And we think largely because of the use in traditional medicines. So lots of poor people out here will poison carcasses sometimes. No, I don't mean that. I mean, there are lots of poor, poor people out here. And so some of the more desperate ones might poison, say, a goat carcass, and in so doing, poison the vultures that came to eat it. And they, in turn, would then be sold to traditional healers for various concoctions and soothsaying. Unfortunately, that is one of the realities of living in an area where there is such abject poverty. And we're often asked about those sorts of things. And of course, it's not easy to be a poacher or to be a, um, a hunter of wild animals in a game reserve because it's not safe. I mean, it's quite dangerous. <coughs> so I think a lot of people would far rather go off to the supermarket and buy something to eat rather than try and hunt it. Now, it's well to remember that when we bemoan the role of poachers. Right, that is the white-backed vulture. On that sombre note, I think we should push on, don't you, jean -Dre? The yeah. atmosphere of the vulture is making me sombre. And you want to know, will only the non-migratory birds be here, the resident birds? Uh, Velma, you will have a few migrants back, very few in August. We'll get the... And the Wahlberg's eagles should be back sort of mid-August. Sorry about that, everybody. I will go silent every so often if the signal gets bad. Um, so, Velma, only those two I think you'll find, the Wahlberg's eagle and the yellow-billed kite. Otherwise, just the resident birds. But there's still lots of resident birds here. So I don't think you'll have a bad birding time. And, of course, in August, very little leaves on the trees, so it's pretty good for birding. It's pretty easy to go birding. If you really are a keen ornithologist, though, the 
uh, arrived at the home of the hyenas. Let's go and have a look there. Got distracted by on my journey towards the home of the hyenas by somebody having a field day in this termite mound. I'm actually going to hop off because we've got some really interesting visuals here of the scrapes and the claw marks. Obviously something's been digging, something's had a wonderful time. And when I managed to extricate myself from the combination of cables and rain cover and door, I'm gonna show you exactly what it is we're looking at. So you can see very clearly where something has been digging all along the side of the termite mound here. And if you look really carefully, you can actually see the claw marks and the scrape marks where it's dug in. Now it's fairly, I would say, fairly clear to me just by the distance of those claws and the amount of dirt that's been excavated, this looks like to me the work of a art fark. One other option, there's a couple of options, it could even be hyenas, but the shape of the hole and the way that it's been dug doesn't seem to suggest that. And also if you look here, this mark over here, you can see where it's been slightly pushed down. That looks like the tail of where an art fox has been sitting and digging backwards towards himself. Now, something that you can't see, and unfortunately, I can't actually bring the vehicle to you or bring the vehicle up here so that you can, is the termites already busy building or rebuilding the damage that's been done to their, their home. And there's soldiers as well. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? They took me by surprise. I'm just going to grab my phone. And I'll take a quick picture for you. Oh, in theory, I'm going to grab my phone. It's also trapped under layers of covers. But I'll just take a quick picture and a video, and I'll show you exactly what it looks like down there. Because it's really interesting. You can see them rebuilding. So the soldiers are out as well. They've obviously the first to respond when any damage is done to their termite mound. There we go. And I've just realized that by talking while I took that video, you're now going to have, uh, that, you're going to have deja vu uh, when I show you the result. So well this morning. There morning. we go. Um, Turn that down at the same out. time. Turn my screen brightness up, and then I'll show you exactly what it is I'm looking at. So look here, you can see the little worker termites rebuilding, and the soldiers as well, the larger soldiers with their big heads, that's what they're doing. All of the little workers already rebuilding that grayish patch alongside here is where they are rebuilding their termite mound and patching up the hole that an art fark has made. Interesting. So there's an art fark in the area somewhere. That dirt is still wet and the termites are still very much at work. Let me replug myself in. Now they've had an interesting evening. Oh, that was exciting. Fascinating to witness. What surprises me is that, oh, I was going to say that more damage hasn't been done, but that's not true. <laughs> Raw was wondering, do I think those termites are tasty when fried up with a little bit of honey and chili? Honey and chili I'm not too sure about, but I can speak from experience. I have tried eating termites before. They taste a little bit like a peanut butter, in my opinion. You gotta be careful though, when eating copious amounts, if you're ever in a survival situation, because unlike art fox, your system is not really built for a diet based solely on termite food. And as a result, you're gonna find yourself with a somewhat upset stomach. So, large or copious quantities of termites will result in gastric discomforts, let's put it that way. 
but it is possible they are nutritious and people have been known to survive by feeding on termites but not necessarily termites alone but by feeding on termites dave do you feel what i feel is it drop in temperature a drop in temperature and the odd sort of mist falling down upon us ah so the rain did return after all i was starting to doubt it we were told that this huge rain front would bring days worth of rain and so far that hasn't exactly proved to be true we've got 24 hours worth of rain and then it's just stayed cool and cloudy but now it's starting to drizzle ever so gently upon us we're fine for now although i'm going to put my phone away where it was not too far away from the hyena den i made sure that i folded up the rain cover dave i'm glad we kept the rain cover on after all we had a bit of a discussion about it this morning and decided that it would be better to be safe than to be sorry so back to that aardvark sighting or aardvark digging sighting you can actually see what had happened was the art fork had come in, dug and come across the workers. So the workers are usually the ones closest to the surface, interspersed with one or two soldiers. And they immediately release a pheromone, a sort of a, a panic or a threat pheromone, that then brings the soldiers rushing to the fore. And it's amazing how resilient art fork are to the attentions of the soldiers, because the soldiers have very fierce mandibles that they are capable of using to inflict powerful bites on any attacking force. The art folk have long since learned to ignore those little nips and to continue feeding. Obviously it wasn't as productive as the art folk had hoped though. Oh goodness, it's actually drizzling. I'm going to stop before we get to the entrance to the hyena den and just put my dashboard cover on. <laughs> now Matt, as we make our way to the hyena den, Matt has an experience. He has just got a great day in puppy and I guess is experience the rap experiencing the rapid growth that he is asking about. I'm just going to stop here at the entrance to the hyena den. I've got to put at least a dashboard cover on. And I wouldn't mind rescuing my book either. So Matt, you were wondering if any mammals experience rapid growth in the same way that your Great Dane puppy is. And I know exactly what you mean. I had a Vimarana puppy, so not quite as large as a Great Dane, but certainly seemed to double in size when I'd stopped looking at her for five minutes. So Matt, the, probably the best example is hyenas. Now the mothers being as large as they are, have ex exceptional milk production qualities. So hyena milk is one of the richest in protein of any of the mammal species. Put Brent's camera away at the same time. He left me with that. Hyenas are a very good example, but just look at our impala babies. So the impala babies were born in December. We were watching them come out and frolic when they were still new to the world, the wide world outside. And yet all of a sudden, they are absolutely pretty much the size of the adults, or almost the size of the adults. And they've started to grow their horns already as well. The little males have really started sprouting horns in less than, what would that be? four months, five months, that they've already reached that stage. So it's a huge advantage out here to grow as quickly as possible. Because the faster you grow, the higher your chances of survival. Birds, for example, baby birds, something like a lilac breasted roller, and I did some research into this when Scott found that lilac breasted roller nest a couple of months ago. They will be fully fledged in less than a month. 19 days it takes for a baby lilac breasted roller to get its feathers and to be exiting the nest. Everybody watch your heads. Duck. Here we go. Oh, I think this drizzle might actually discourage 
hyena cubs from coming out. They might want to stay where it's warm and cozy. As we approach them, we can start to see when we look back at the size of November compared to what he is looking like now. So November named November because he was first seen as a cub in November. Already at a couple of months old, spotty and looking where did you come from? <laughs> it came up behind me. There's only one visible at the moment. Ah, uh, you've chosen the other side, you sneaky hyenas. This is the one thing about this den. It's a merry dance. I think they're playing. There we go. Let's um, just have a quick look at that before I reposition. It was a bit of a a play fight going on. There you can see that upwards facing tail, that's excitement. Right, let's get onto that side of the fallen knob thorn. I, I will always think of this as the hyena den of U-turns. It's not the Aubrey's Road den, it is the U-turn den. It was the same the last time they were here as well. Because manoeuvring about is not all that easy. It's quite a dense block. Good morning. How are we? How are we doing? Hello, madam. That's not actually madam, sorry. It's somebody with an enormous belly, though. Jeepers creepers. That stomach. That's incredible. Now that to me is one of the mothers. I think it might have been Corky. So it's not a pregnant hyena. That is just a food baby, if you could describe it that way. She is just so full. Her stomach is physically swaying from side to side. Madam also is here. She's also looking enormous. Now, everything is absolutely loving the termite explosion, and James has found another animal benefiting, so let's have a look. Everybody, you can see a small black spot in that tree there. That is a virtual starling. Um, it was sitting on the ground right in front of the vehicle, of course, until it realized that you were coming to look at it, and then it flew off. And it was just a wonderful example of the purple and blue and turquoise and green that are the incredible feathers of the virtual starling. In fact, all of the glossy starlings that we get here. I think uh, let us not waste further time with them. As Jamie says, they are enjoying the, high, the, the termites, but maybe you should head back and enjoy the hyenas. We will continue. Just giving the chance, or the hyenas a chance, to move in front of me before I reposition. But the two little cubs, it's so hard to believe that they were once upon a time little black bundles of fur. This, believe it or not, is Madam's cubs. Here's one playing king of the castle on the root system. Oh! Hard to believe it's the same hyena cubs we saw for the first time less than two months ago that were terrified of everything and hiding in the safety of the den. Now completely coordinated, or mostly coordinated, and treating the den like their own personal jungle gym. Yes, you do. Hello. Were you full of fun and mischief? And as the cubs of the matriarch, they're going to be particularly boisterous and brave. survey. I'm going to try and get you a nice view of these cubs. They're being highly entertaining. Survey was wondering if you ever come into contact with a cackle of hyenas, what is the best way to handle them? And the answer, my best answer to give you, and I don't believe it, the cubs want to go to the other side of the den now. Cheeky monsters. Um, here we go probably the best view we're going to get from here. Survey, 
Uh, coming across a cackle of hyenas, and I assume you mean on foot, since they would definitely not be doing anything to the vehicle. Survey, I would suggest just enjoy it. Hyenas, we are not on their menu. We are not a prey species to anything out here. With very limited exceptions, the odd lion that has been known to... Oh! <laughs> did you catch a termite or did you miss? I think you missed. Oof, double trouble, look at them. Just like your pet dogs and cats at home, trying to snap termites out of the air. Somewhat unsuccessfully. Oh, scratch, oh, big scratch. So hyenas are not a threat to us on foot. The only time a hyena is ever a threat to a human being is if you are <laughs> sleeping. I want it, I want the stick. No, I'm gonna chew on the back of your neck then if I can't have the stick. The only time that hyenas are ever a threat is if you are sleeping out in the open without any protection, where they will take chances and come and investigate possibly using those powerful crushing jaws that the cub is currently demonstrating. Fearsome, I'm a very fierce predator. I'm going to show the stick how fierce I am. It's also teething pains. Their permanent teeth are gonna start coming through in the next few weeks. So being able to chew on the stick. And a little bit of affection here as well between the two cubs. being savaged, very valid point. Yeah, um, we do have a virtual reality rig on the front of the vehicle and Kirsty's raised a very good point that they are sitting in the rain. Dave's also thinks that we should probably rescue them before the rain gets any harder. We were so busy focusing on the rest of the equipment in the vehicle that we forgot about the virtual reality rig. So we will have to take that off. And to do that, we're going to have to move away from the hyena den. It doesn't seem as though it's going to let up. It's quite light at the moment, but I don't think this rain is going to disappear. I think this drizzle is going to set in for the rest of the morning. So while we do that, let's find out what James is up to. We'll be back with you as quickly as possible. Thank you, Kirst. Oh. Still with James, so we'll stay with a view of the hyena cubs. Having a quick scratch. And a gamble. Rolling around and chewing on each other. It's so nice to have a sibling to play with. It must be quite lonely being an only child if you're a hyena cub. Luckily, they've got cousins and siblings to keep themselves entertained, but also to build up the coordination and practice the techniques that they're actually going to need as adults. They've got quite a few months still in the protection and care of the hyena den. But even so, once it, become, once it gets to the point that they wrestle and tumble, or it comes to the point that they move off as sub-adults on their own, they will actually need those skills in order to survive. And that's when the highest mortality rate actually comes in with hyena cubs, which is once they've left the den and are moving up off as sub-adults. James has been fitting his car with the rain cover and since he's finished up doing that, let's go over there and I'm going to just make sure we are thoroughly rainproofed. I'm staring at you with a gormless grin on my face, everyone, because Jandre is attempting to put on a rain cover that looks like it was built for, I don't know, it looks like it was built for a very oddly shaped toy, maybe an octopus, but definitely not for the camera that he's using to film me with. Right, there's a bit of rain coming in and we can actually see it there. It's blowing in. And you can see it, it looks like a scotch mist coming in there across your 
across your screen go three hardy dar ibis. How oh, very, very convenient to them to do that then. Chandra, would you like to imitate their call for us? That's not very good. Right, we're on the far eastern boundary of the reserve. And uh, we have found not much in the way of tracks. That's not surprising. It's not to say that animals haven't come to or fro, hither and yon, across this path line. And that is it's just simply a function of the, the rain. Now it is starting to fall gently onto my face. Like a great African blessing. Our plan from here, everyone, is to head towards Beefle's Hook Dam, which is just up the road here. See what's there. Uh, well, not for any reason other than it's a sort of nice focal point to go to and to just see what's going on. I love seeing the water animals that come out, the terrapins, and hopefully a few frogs and toads, and then some of the water birds that we get out here when there's a bit of water. Now, had we had rains like this earlier on in the season, you would have found that our bird diversity was much higher than it is now. screen for a second there. Ooh. Sorry, jean -Luc, can you just have a look up here? Blake, I will answer your question. I think I can just see in the top of that tree a hole, and that hole is where those parrots that just flew out, which you would have heard going, beep, 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 beep. those are brown-headed parrots, and they are living in a nest there. And it's interesting because just next to us here, jean Rain. Rain. Oh, yes. Sorry about that. But that, isn't that a lovely picture, everyone? Just over there is the old nest that they used to live in, and it fell out of this tree a little while back. The tree rotted, and of course, if you dig into wood and then leave it, it will eventually rot. It doesn't have the bark to then protect it. And that's where they used to live, and then that fell off the tree, and they've obviously found another cavity within the same dead marula tree. And you can see where the woodpeckers and wood-boring insects have absolutely hammered the trunk looking for insects, and then that will open up the wood to bacteria. I'm just listening carefully. A lion kill. Sorry, everybody. They're talking about a lion kill we might actually be within Traverse region of. It's on Gauri Main or Biffle's Hook. I don't know what that means. Lex, please, can you go with that position again? It's not making sense to me. Yeah, go ahead. Gary Main Road, that's this road we've just been on. Uh, west of the little girl. Oh, copy that. How many stations there? Sorry, everyone. I will get back to you. Okay. All right, Lex, if you wouldn't mind just keeping me posted, if you think a space might open up, that would be great. Okay, we can't go there now, everybody, but there is a lion kill, actually. It's probably just south of our boundary, but it will be viewable for us. Uh, but unfortunately, there are already about 75 people there, and it was found by people, what we call on the Eastern Channel, so Chitra Chitra Cheetah Plains, and they're cycling through the sighting. Now, we'll go there a little bit later. And because the weather's like this, uh, it should still be pretty exciting. Sorry about that. That is the way of sharing the land. And now, Blake in Nevada, you wanted to know about flamingos, and we don't have any flamingos in this area. Now, flamingos are 
Well, they're not adapted to deserts, but they can live in deserts, but they're adapted to living in salt pans, uh, where they eat algae and plankton, depending on whether they're the greater or lesser flamingo, and that's where they get their pink color from. And they've got an astonishing way of feeding. It's unique in the bird world, where they, they don't, I mean, you, the way you imagine a bird eating in water would be for its beak to sort of go down into the water and then it would pick things up and put them in the mouth. Uh, uh, flamingos got sort of a pumping system and they've actually put their heads, if that's the flamingo's beak, they invert it and put it into the water like that and they just open the side of the mouth and their little filaments that filter the water and their tongue acts like a pump and it pumps up and down and the water gets pumped through these filaments and very tiny little microscopic organisms get stuck in the filaments and then they swallow that and that's the food and very few birds in fact almost none are able to eat such tiny things as the flamingo is able to because of that specialized filter feeding way of feeding did you know that Andre? Yes, you did. Uh, I did There's a quite thick scotch mist blowing in, isn't there? Shandra is looking a little uncomfortable. He's got a very a smart jacket on. Unfortunately, it's about as waterproof as a tea bag, so he's going to become wet. <laughs> now extremely wet. Hello, Lion Eye. <laughs> you want to know if we need a special license to drive a vehicle like this? No, man, it's very easy. We can do... No, we don't need any kind of special license. In fact, you don't legally need a license at all to drive on private land so legally you can drive this without a license uh, if you want a guide though so if you're taking a if you're actually taking paying guests on a game drive you need a normal license and then you need something called a public driver's permit uh, which is basically uh, it doesn't require you to be able to drive any further but you've got to register as somebody who drives people around but no in terms of actual driving license, no, nothing, nothing required. Thank you, Lion's Eye. All right, let's go back to Jamie. She's still at the hyena den. I don't think much is going on there. Unfortunately, it seems as though the hyena cubs have gone to ground as the rain gets heavier and heavier. They've all dashed for cover just while we were dashing to cover our vehicle. Oh, except for that one. That one's an exception to that rule. <laughs> Dave, did you see that at all? I didn't snuck up behind us. Hello, little one. Are you also looking for a bit of shelter from the rain? Looks like it might be. One of, it's one of the sub-adults, and I almost want to say it's June, but she's grown, June's grown so much but I have a hard time keeping track until I go back and compare it to the other hyenas. And you're not gonna believe this, Dave. There's actually two hyenas here. The other one is Madam, and she has hidden herself. I'll go forward a little bit. She has tucked herself so tightly into, I don't even know where the best view is going to be from. Probably, if you can try and, can you see where I'm looking? She's through at the base of that tree, oh, yeah. right at the back there. I'm not sure where to get a good view of her. There, you can see the spots in the top of your screen. That is Madam, hiding away and fast asleep. Honestly, would never have realized she was there if I hadn't stopped to look twice. Surprisingly hidden for an animal that doesn't really rely too much on camouflage. Gentle drizzle coming through. I'm going to just pop my jacket on. I thought I could get away with not doing that, but that is definitely not going to be the case before my shirt becomes too waterlogged. There's June investigating. Unlike the hyena cubs that cannot 
actually fit in, or the hyena cubs that can actually shelter themselves in the den site itself, the adult hyenas can't get in there. Not even the sub-adult hyenas can go very far into the den. They might be able to cover a little bit or go in a little bit, but for the most part, it's one of the reasons why hyena dens are designed the way that they are, because the cubs actually excavate the tunnels themselves. What have you got there? So by excavating the tunnels themselves and by keeping them open, they actually make sure that the tunnels are small enough for them, or big enough for them, but too small for any threats to make their way in. What on earth have you got? It looks like a shoulder blade. It is a shoulder blade. <laughs> Marianne saying that she can see why hyenas are not kept as pets if they communicate and explore with their mouths. And Marianne, in fact, they are kept as, in inverted commas, pets in certain parts of South Africa, a practice that I hugely disagree with. Uh, Marianne, don't forget as well that not only do they communicate with their mouths, but they also have an exceptionally well-developed anal gland, and they like to anal paste all around their homes. So you can just imagine the smell that would be attached to your furniture and your curtains and indeed your leg at times if you were to keep a hyena as a pet. That being said, they are wild animals and they are very, they're pretty much impossible to truly domesticate. There are people, particularly gangs around Nigeria, so right up in North Africa, that keep hyenas as, as pets and as status symbols most of the time, those hyenas are held back by big, thick chains and with muzzles around their faces to stop them from biting anyone or to prevent the risk of them biting anyone. But there are places where they are kept as pets. Apparently, they are exceptionally affectionate to those that they really like. It would be interesting. I think that a female, funnily enough, I think that a female, because you, you all know about Kevin Richardson, the man who rescues lions and has formed a very deep bond with them. He also has hyenas that he's formed quite a deep bond with. And I don't think it would work as well, first of all, in terms of physical strength, but I also don't think it would work as well being a female looking after hyenas, unless that, that hyena was a male. I think that you would find yourself in a really difficult dominance display with a female. Whereas with a human man, he can automatically, or in the hyena's mind, he automatically assumes a subservient role to a female. But if you've got a female, it becomes a little bit more Andrew, tricky. Andrew, an interesting one. But definitely not an animal I would ever want as a pet. They're too intelligent and also they are such social beings that it seems almost cruel to want to extract them from a family life that is so important to them and so much a crucial part of their individual identities and who they are. This rain cover, as always, working perfectly at, at redirecting the water to my bottom area. June is still very much attached to that shoulder blade that she's managed to collect there, having a good old munch. But I think that is pretty much the sole hyena activity that's going to occur. I'm gonna, oh, she's lying down now. All the better to chew with. Now, oh, exotic animal, or the exotic animal or the pet trade is a huge problem that faces all of us. And when you sit and you watch them in this natural wild, wild environment, it's so sad to imagine that there are those living in domestic or captive situations. Bravos Yak has actually said the hyenas are looking so healthy. I would go so far as to say that the hyenas are actually almost looking obese. That stomach that was on Corky, they've obviously found something large my guess would be maybe a hippo, possibly a buffalo, but something that they've been munching on that's kept them very full looking for the last two days. I mean, stomachs that are swinging that are that big. Incredible to see how much a predator like a hyena or a lion or even a leopard can actually manage to force down. All an adaptation because you don't know when your next meal is coming from. And if you leave that kill, you don't know if it's still going to be there when you come back to it. So they can't really afford to eat delicately or lightly. They just have to stuff themselves. But Brazos, you're right. The hyenas are looking very happy. The drought has benefited them hugely and will continue to benefit them hugely. 
and their population is probably going to boom. The one, two, three, four, five cubs, the five young cubs under four months old at this den site have a very high chance of survival over the next few months. And it's only really when they reach the sub-adult stage that that may or may not change. But the hyenas are going to be the first to benefit from this drought, as are the lions and the leopards. Let's do one more check around the other side of the den site, and then we'll move on. I don't think the hyena cubs want to come and stand in the rain. Brenda, who is watching in Canada, Brenda's been watching some of the videos of the previous drives. And Brenda happened to witness that incredibly savage attack that occurred between the hyenas themselves on one female, where her ear, as far as I know, it was a female, it was a sighting with Scott, where her ear was essentially torn off to the point of it will, it will fall off, she will no longer have that ear and her foot was crunched to the point that it will no longer be a functional foot. And Brenda was wondering if anybody knew what happened to her or her baby. Interestingly, the answer to that is the baby that you are thinking of, the sub-adult that followed her away, was not in fact her baby, but was the son, the sub-adult son of the matriarch that we're looking at now, whose name is Bella. And Bella's demonstrated that behavior at least three times in a row following behind. What's the matter, little one? You've got an anxious look to you. Oh. Something happening. Are the other hyenas coming back? Now, Brenda, unfortunately, I don't... I haven't seen that hyena since. There have, after that, been a couple of other fights where we've seen the victim afterwards and they've been absolutely fine. It's amazing how tremendously resilient these animals truly are in terms of their healing ability. But in that particular attack, we haven't seen a one-eared, three-legged hyena wandering around. I hope that she survived. I can't confirm it. I know that my mother, it was actually my morning off that particular morning, and my mom phoned me in absolute tears, devastated about what had happened, and she kept saying, I think it's your hyena. So she was very, very upset. Uh, I have seen three-legged hyenas in the past that have survived, so it is possible. I mean, we once saw, we once actually encountered a snared hyena. We only saw pictures of it on camera traps. This was not here. This was where I used to work previously, which had a slightly bigger problem with bush meat poaching and metal snares being put up around the fences. We caught a camera trap picture of a hyena with a snare wrapped around its neck. I was convinced this thing was going to die. We went and we searched for it high and low because we were actually going to try and either get it medical attention or we actually thought we were going to end up having to put it down. We couldn't find it and for about a year we couldn't find it. And a year later this hyena popped out with a scar around its neck but looking happy and healthy and as fit as could be. So Brenda, at the moment we don't know but well, that remains to be seen. We could still see that hyena happy and healthy somewhere and maybe just been hiding away, licking her wounds for the moment. The drizzle's abated a little bit, but with it, it has brought out all manner of creepy callies and other things. So let's have a look at which particular one James has found. Great. Now, as you can see, everybody, I have taken a great risk to bring you entertainment of a kind that is not normally seen unless you are watching an R-rated violent movie, a giant land snail, which at great personal risk to myself, I have placed upon the dashboard in the hopes that it will come out and say hello to us. Now, I think it will if we're patient, but while we sit here, just a few things about the giant land snail which I think are very interesting. The first, of course, is that it lives for up to 10 years. 
can you believe it, a snail that lives for 10 years. Now, we've seen very few of these this year, simply because we haven't had any weather like this, and they love this sort of weather. It allows them to come out and kind of, otherwise they desiccate. They go very dry very quickly if they aren't. Um, sorry, I'm just going to turn the game drop radio down on my ear. They go very dry very quickly. Um, if they don't have rain. And what they do during the rain, during the dry times, is cover the end. I'm not going to pick it up because I want it to actually come out. They cover the, the entrance to the snail. You've all seen a snail shell and the entrance to it with a film of sand. And then they sort of find a secluded spot and hope that they won't be discovered by something that wants to eat them. Yes. Hmm? Oh, sorry, apparently it's good to hear. Is that better, Jandre? Ah, good. The honey badger on my chest is much better now. Sorry, I had my jacket up, of course, on account of the inclement weather. Um, and then the other thing about this snail, of course, is that it eats dry plants. But it likes, this, it likes it when they're a bit wet, and it waits for the plants to rot. And then it has this incredible mouth part called a radula which is like a, um, it's a bit like a chainsaw. If you can imagine a chainsaw which moves around uh, with teeth on it, and it, that's exactly what this thing's like. It's like a sort of a toothed tongue which moves around in the mouth and sort of picks up the bits of drying and dead plant material, and that's what it eats. And it becomes this vast size. And this one is being particularly irritating because it will not come out of its shell. Come on. Stick your head out. There's a wonderful Irish song, which, on account of the fact that there's nothing else to tell you about the snail before it sticks its head out, I'm now going to sing. It is a, a, <laughs> it's a kid's song that I heard uh, from a wonderful group called the Clancy Brothers, and it goes like this. Shellacky, shellacky, bookie, stick out all your horns. All the ladies are coming to see ya. Join in with me, Chandra. Shellacky, shellacky, bookie, stick out all your horns. All the ladies are coming to see ya. That was, of course, in an attempt to make the snail stick its horns out. Has this one? <laughs> has not done. <laughs> I think I think we'd just take him with us, to be honest. No, we can't do that. That's nasty. All right, I'm going to take him off. That's a real pity. They, really are, they are so impressive when they stick, take the time to come out and say hello. That's what he looks like. And that underside there will be covered in a film of sand in the dry. <laughs> Thank you, Shellaki Buki, for your pathetic performance today. Pathetic! Pathetic! Right, we're on our way to Buffleshook Dam. That's probably the most bizarre safari experience you've ever had. Possibly the most bizarre I've ever had. Chancy Brothers and Tommy Makem brought live to the African bushveld. <laughs> oh. Apparently, Jamie Patterson knows a song about, a Swedish song about a frog, which she thinks I should sing to you. Well, as I don't know the song, the Swedish song about the frog, I think you're going to have to ask her to sing it for you. Um, if her musical background is in, I've never heard her sing, but she is, of course, extremely musical. Her brother is a brilliant oboist and pianist, so I think you'll probably find that she has a very fine voice on her. So I definitely think you should get her to sing the Swedish song about the frog. Now, there's quite a lot of bird calling around here. Thank you, James Richard. You say you love giant land snails. I love them too. I think they're fascinating. There are two orioles shouting at each other here. There, 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 there. Obviously, it's flown away at a great speed. And another one. And those are the black-headed orioles. And one of the things that I'm sad we haven't seen more of this year 
is the European golden oriole, which is a purely gold bird with just black wings. And it is the most incredible yellow color. You can't believe it, but they're very secretive. You can hear them calling, that lovely liquid call. Bethany, good question. Why is it called a giant land snail? I mean, the giant bit's pretty obvious, but as you say, uh, land snail, are, are there snails that live in water? Yes, there are many snails that live in water. Snails, uh, there are probably, they're probably thousands of species of snails wor worldwide, some of them as big as that, and some of them microscopic, or almost invisible to the naked eye. And of course, one of the major snails that lives in water out here is the Bilharzia carrying snail, and they live in water. So lots of snails do live in water, yes. And I mean, certainly if you go to the intertidal zone on the coast, you'll find lots and lots of different kinds of uh, snail-like animals, limpets and things like that, you know, which live in water and sometimes out of it. But they all need water, of course, because they have that very kind of moist body that will desiccate or dry out very fast if they don't have water. You had a nice view here of this mist blowing in. I love these questions because I can't answer them. Cecilia, you want to know if a snail has got, an, got ears? I don't know. Um, I'm gonna say I don't think so. I would think that most of their perception of sound would come from their antennae, which are stick out the front of their, their faces and out the front there, and probably from vibrations on the ground. So I'm not sure that they pick up uh, sound. In other words, it's probably pretty pointless singing Irish songs to them. Uh, and I was correct. Thank you for that, Kirsten. She's Googled it. Uh, Cecilia, a snail does not have ears. Here are some kudu, everyone. Please don't run away, Mrs. Kudu. The only heartbeat we have. So a beautiful female kudu as we approach Beefle's Hook Dam, walking in the mist. And she'll be loving the water dripping off the leaves. Kudu, of course, are almost water independent. And especially when there's a bit of moisture on the surface of the leaves, they won't need to drink at all. Try and get a sense of the atmosphere around here. And while you just get an idea of the con of the sort of atmosphere out here, Boyd, North Carolina, you want to know if there are any plants out here that have a high moisture content and are therefore actively selected by animals. Uh, Boyd, yes, I suppose there are some. Uh, but the succulents, you know, the kind of desert plants or arid xerophytes that do hold water often are toxic, simply for exactly that reason, so that the animals don't eat them. All right, so let me just, let's just try and develop you a sense of this atmosphere. Very gentle sounds of birds, hornbills, the odd grey-headed bushrike. we go. And then the soft, soft sound of gentle rain falling on the canvas around us and onto the land. All the sounds are very gentle at the moment. Woodpecker. And then the smell is just one of rain. Beautiful rain smell. And you can feel you've all been outside and felt the rain on your face. And that's what it feels like now, like a soft sort of caressing, like the cloud has kind of sat on us and is, is sort of caressing us.
What's a bird called today? All right, let's just let's press on to the dam here and have a quick look. We're just going to go along to the dam here. I know Jamie has got another snail to show you, but given the speed at which a snail uh, moves, we're going to go down and have a quick video. Kind of activity for you. Okay. Uh, you will receive the snail. Right here is the water. was saying he hadn't seen it like this since June last year, correct? Yes. But not even fuller, eh? Hey? All about the same. And that was at a time when Bob, the bachelor of Biffle's Hook, was a resident. Lots of terrapins around here. I've never seen as many terrapins as I have this year. As soon as there's a tiniest puddle, the terrapins come out of their Easterbation hideouts. You can hear now the red-billed buffalo weavers. And also, sounds like a tawny-flanked prinier. Lovely sound all over. There's also a white-bellied sunbird going. We'll try and find one. Of course, they're magnificent to look at. Birds are very excited around here. And the ubiquitous woodland kingfisher. Let's try and go a little bit forward. I'm going to try and find some of these birds, but I think we're going to lose signal. So while we move around, let's go across to Jamie and her snail. Enjoy that for now. Just chatting to Andrew, who's come up just behind us as James sent you across to us. So just bear with me one moment. I'm going to move out of his way and say good morning to him. And I'll keep my little discovery on the dashboard. Clunk. There we go. I hadn't actually shut my door either. So maybe a positive thing that we managed to discover that. Morning, Andrew. Good morning. How are you? Good, good. Good, thanks. Hello, everybody. Feeling a little bit... Um, I think James is going to follow up. Oh, OK. OK, Thank enjoy. You. Cheers, guys. All right, so I know that you had that giant land snail with James, and I wanted to just show you one of their smaller and slightly more mysterious cousins. Put this my thumbnail next to it for scale. Look who we have found. Oh, it's really raining now. This is one of the exotic snails that we found several of in that one bushwalk I did after a brief rain spell many weeks ago. And I said I didn't know what it was, and neither did Steph, and in fact, neither did anybody when we attempted to try and identify it. Eventually, having approached several experts, we got the idea that it may in fact be an exotic species that has been introduced at some stage, and that we hadn't seen it before because they have go through sort of population explosions every couple of years, between every two to five years. And it's this little snail, have a look at this, and they don't, they, a lot of snails do this apparently. This cap over here is almost like a hinge that they produce, and it stops them from A, dehydrating, and B, provides quite a protective hard covering. Now, I don't want to poke it because he is alive. He is hiding in there. That is the cap that covers that he's produced in the same way that they produce the rest of the shell. So apart from discovering that it is an exotic snail, we have yet to actually clarify whether or not it is, or what its particular species name is. I don't want to disrupt him too much, which is why I didn't want to drive around with him. I want to put him back to, from, back to where he came from. How's that rain treating you back there, Dave? Yes, very refreshing. Very, very refreshing. Let's describe it that way. 
Uh, we also saw a bright orange snail that particular day, which I still have also not managed to identify. I'm just going to try and redirect some of the water that's pooling here away from the electronics and into the footwell. There we go. That's better. But Lucy in Indiana was wondering, do, um, do, do snails come in different colors? Or how are you doing there, Dave? Are you, are you winning? He's just, uh, Dave's just trying to seek a rain cover. On show. While he does that, I'll answer Lucy in Indiana's question. Lucy was wondering, do snails come in different colors? And the answer to that, Lucy, is not so much with the giant land snails. They tend to have that very solid brown approach to life. I'll just check behind my seat, Dave, if you can reach. Can you not reach? You got it? <laughs> it's getting harder. It's running down the back of my neck. It's uh, in my hair. It's a bit damp. But Lucy, we do get different colored snails. You, you abandoned the effort. Yeah. Dave, they've decided it's not worth the attempting to find his poncho. <laughs> That's too late for me. I should have had it on ages ago. I mistakenly thought that the rain was over and that we were done for the morning. My mistake, we are not done. We are definitely not done. <laughs> so I'm going to pop the snail in. <laughs> Oops, I'm gonna do that. Steph, Steph wants us to be able to identify this little snail, so I'm going to keep it for now. I'll actually probably save it from near death by drowning. So let me pop it in a, a dry part underneath the rain cover. There you go, little snail. Be safe there. Let us continue on on a very damp journey. Um, Dave, I think I can reach my little poncho from here. Sorry, everyone. Let me just try and rescue poor sodden Dave. I don't know where they've gone. I don't know where they've gone. I'm sorry, Dave. Right. Onwards. On we drive. Rejoicing. Rejoicing in the rain. This will bring out all manner of frogs and snails and other things that little boys are made of. I'm going to put my cap on. Not because I'm being blinded by the sun, but because I'm being blinded by the rain. It just keeps it off my face or out of my eyes ever so slightly. Let's go see what animals, what the animals are up to in this torrential downpour of monsoon-like proportions. Okay, that's a slight exaggeration. Let me just make sure my microphone's sufficiently sheltered as well in my jacket. Otherwise, reptiles making an appearance. Bill has got a question about one of the largest ones that you could see up here. Bill wants to know if we get any crocodiles in the Juma area. And the answer is there are three little ones around Sydney's dam, Bill, that we know of. But crocodiles are a funny thing. They come and go, they can cover enormous distances. And when you think that a dam doesn't have a crocodile, and one day maybe it doesn't, the next day it absolutely could. Of course, they're capable of coming off out onto the land and moving along over land and they can cover many many miles and many kilometers on foot so they move from where is appropriate where they might find a lot of food where is comfortable for them and if that starts to dry off dry up then they'll move along so the fact that the juma dam now has water you never know. We could find a crocodile in there, maybe a little crocodile, maybe a slightly larger one. We definitely won't be getting the, the biggest examples of the crocodiles, those sort of three, four meter, uh, nine feet or over crocs. I would be quite surprised if we saw one of them. You never know, we could. You never say never out here. I, for example, went out thinking that it wasn't going to rain and look how mistaken I was. So, Bill, yes, we could get crocodiles here. We just have to manage to get them on camera. And I'm sure that in the past, the previous safari drives that have been conducted in a normal rainy season would have been able to view crocodiles around the various dams. So any one of the dams could contain crocodiles. 
I've seen people in estates swimming in dams before and I've often taken a moment and just thought maybe that's not terribly sensible because you think there's not a crocodile there but is that really a risk that you want to take? It's quite common for people in this area to lose domestic dogs if they live close to rivers. It's quite common for them to very sadly lose domestic dogs that go down and have a sniff or a drink around the water and get caught by a crocodile. And of course, you can't fence a crocodile either because it's surprisingly difficult, funnily enough, to fence a river. So if they want to and if they choose to, they can move through an area and move between parks and underneath fences and into rivers. Unfortunately, as soon as they escape the protection of parks, they immediately become a target for those looking for crocodile meat and crocodile skins, which can be sold for a considerable price. It's best for most crocodiles if they stay within the protection of the various conservation areas and reserves. <sighs> Nippy. And if you do decide to go for a little wander into the dams, Alice was wondering, would you find leeches? And yes, you could find leeches, and I have before pulled leeches off me, having waded through parts of the rivers. Uh, I haven't seen any around here, but to be completely honest, Alice, I haven't gone wandering into the dam. Perhaps we should ask James that question, and maybe even address it even further to Graham, and see if maybe they encountered any leeches on their now famous trip into the Juma Dam in order to rescue the first, first sort of trial flight of the drone that went horribly wrong and sent it plunging into the murky and muddy depths of the Juma waterhole. Perhaps they can tell us if they encountered any leeches there. I haven't in this area. I have very close to here, but it was more in the sort of river systems that run through and empty into the Olifants, which is the second largest river in the Kruger Park. So I worked on a reserve with two different rivers, and there were leeches in there, as well as all manner of freshwater mussels. There's a surprising amount of life within the thick muds and sands around dams and waterholes. animals in weather like this do what these poor shivering impala are doing, which is to try and find some shelter. One of them's managed to find shelter in a guari bush. And one wonders how they experience days like today. Do they feel it as discomfort or do they, are they aware of how positive that might be for them? As the rain gets progressively and surprisingly much harder than I expected it to, unfortunately we're now starting to collect water not just around our various body parts, but it is collecting around okay. the expensive equipment that is involved in bringing you live safaris. And what that means for this morning is that we're probably going to close the show down for now and make our way back undercover. If the rain does die off or if it does move away, then we could well be back out. You'll just have to stay tuned and we'll keep you updated and we'll let you know if we're going to go back out or not. I think this rain is going to sort of come in a rolling constant drizzle rain, drizzle rain, drizzle rain. But we'll keep you updated. Please keep your eye on it. So we're going to say a preemptory big thank you to all of you for joining us in our drizzly morning safari. Thank you, Dave. But like a drowned rat, I imagine I do as well. And I'm going to say thank you as well on James's behalf and a farewell to you for now. You never know, we might be back out a little bit later, having dried off ever so slightly. Have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world. Hopefully we'll see you a bit later. If not, we'll see you for the sunset safari. Cheers for now.